The Cabinet in late 2015 authorised the first ever uh, convening of a Culture and Heritage Steering Committee. It's the first time that's been done to have a really comprehensive look at everything that's happened before, a situation analysis of the situation, state of play for culture and heritage fields in the Cayman Islands. Well, when I came into the Ministry, I learned very quickly that it was the, the one aspect of the Ministry's work that there is not a national policy. And so I feel that, i felt it over the years and looking back, that it's probably uh, an area where we as a government, government have not devoted sufficient time and resources to, simply because we don't have a policy, we don't have a guiding roadmap for, for the ministry to accomplish, uh, you know, any of its goals with regard to culture. We created six focus groups, also known as subcommittees, to look at these areas and they range from performing arts to visual arts, creative industry, crafts, um, land-based heritage, maritime heritage, so that we could really get the depth and the breadth of all that's happening in the fields of culture and heritage in Cayman. And last but not least on those subcommittees, and probably the most important, is a legal and governance subcommittee, because that will look at the legal structure, what has teeth as regards culture and heritage here. Think of it as a roadmap. If you don't know where you're going and you don't have a roadmap, you get lost very easily. And that I think is one of the things that has, has plagued cult for culture for us in Cayman in terms of giving it the, the, the right attention and bringing the right resources to bear on, on, on culture. So I think, you know, while we have been spending quite a bit of money over the years on culture, I think one thing we lack is that we don't know whether we are achieving any specific goals or whether what we do and how we spend our money is giving us truly value for how we spend it. We don't know if it's in accordance with what the, uh, you know, the people in the public who embrace and, and are involved very much in culture um, and the development of it, uh, achieving any real objectives for them. So I think it's important for us to have it and give us that roadmap give us the ability to measure just how we spend our money and make sure we channel the limited resources that we have in the right way to achieve the maximum benefit to develop our culture and to help preserve it. Uh, you know, very often people associate policy with policing or they associate policy with a piece of paper with lots of rules and regulations about what can and can't be done. When a, in fact policy is about enabling, it's supposed to enable cultural freedom of cultural expression, it's supposed to enable um, the protection, safeguarding of cultural heritage. And so a policy document is really not meant to be about something that gathers dust. It's supposed to be something which liberates and frees um, residents and citizens of a country to be able to do things which they call their culture and their heritage. Subsequently to the subcommittees being um, created and the various situation analysis which are quite heavy reports being uh, done over several months, we also had a UNESCO endorsed facilitator down for a two-day workshop. What we did at that point was gather all the key stakeholders, most of them came from the focus groups but there were others invited as well. We really identified people mainly in institutions and organizations who were in a leadership role, a chairship role, but also people who were at a more grassroots level in other organizations. Those are the people we also really need to hear from in this whole process. And we brought them together in a two-day workshop. We had an open house. We've had a fantastic survey, the first ever survey that I'm aware of on culture and heritage. And we had almost 600 respondents. So I think the, the response to that was quite good. We're gonna take all of that information, analyze it and respond to it and really take it to heart and see what the public has to say about culture and heritage. I think it's amazing. I think that the process which the Ministry of Health and Culture have embarked on is really amazing. It's wonderful because you can't, I mean, one of the weaknesses in policy development is often where the policy is done in a boardroom, either by an individual or by a few individuals who regard themselves to be the experts. And what the ministry's approach has been is to really draw together teams of people who have 
vast knowledge and experience, expertise of working in their various subsectors and getting them to generate situation analysis and doing SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Because when we develop policy, we need to be addressing those strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Otherwise, it's very hard to measure what it is that we're doing and what change we're effecting by having a policy. We're still in the process of analysing the, the public feedback from, from the survey, but most respondents felt that it was um, imperative for this to be done because what's happening is, is that if we don't have a roadmap, if we don't have a policy, a strategic plan, it means that all the organisations that are getting government funding or in operation at a grassroots level, most of them are doing a fantastic job, but they're all very ad hoc. There's no joined up approach. So if you have an ad hoc approach to anything, it's, it's not going to be done in a way that um, serves the best interests of, of what the vast majority of the public want. So we need to become more organized. There's no um, department of, of culture or heritage. There's the ministry and various ministries that oversee various organizations and the organizations, but there's no sort of joined up approach between the ministries and between these organizations. And that's what we want to see come from now on. Everybody, culture, culture belongs to everybody and we saw from the latest ESO statistics that a large number of our people in the Cayman Islands are from other places in the world. That's what we need for um, the economy to be driven, that's what we need for our labour force. However, I think probably for places like the Cayman Islands and other countries in the world that have such a large immigration rate, we need to be very, very careful to promulgate and protect our heritage and to really celebrate and be proud of our culture as well and not marginalise anybody who comes to live amongst us as well. It's important to recognise the difference between heritage and culture. The heritage speaks to our past. It might not be the same for all of us because people are from various different places, but it speaks to our past and it is in, in danger of dying and decaying and being knocked down and not develop, um, continue to be developed because of the lack of legislation in place. The culture is another, it's another story. Everyone that lives here now can participate in our fabulous mosaic of culture that is Cayman. You know, it's really critical for us to understand that culture and heritage happens everywhere. It's part of the, the challenge we have as cultural and heritage professionals because then it becomes ignored because it's so wide and it's so big and it's so deep. Um, and yet we can't do our work as culture and heritage institutions or as cultural practitioners or as artists if we don't have um, shared understanding with people who work in other sectors who can recognise that they have a role to play. They may be doing work which is very cultural. So the Ministry of Education, for example, are educating young children, young people into becoming adults, citizens, residents of Cayman. Um, and a lot of what they are teaching is a value system and the value system is related to cultural, <laughs> to culture. And so it's important to have them on board as well as planning, as well as governance, um, legislation, legislators, to see that they have a role to play and they need to understand what the needs of the cultural and heritage sector is in order to thrive so that we don't have contradictions and contestations occurring. Once this gets adopted by cabinet and it's rolled out for the country, that it's going to commit the government to bring the resources to bear on culture and give it the attention that it needs. And so they too will understand and know that they can count on government support for funding for programs, whether it be school programs, whatever. Um, they can count on, on the commitment to be there because once we accept it, it does, you know, the commitments ought to follow with it. The very big next step <laughs> is actually reading, collating everything firstly, just collating all of the data that's been collected. Um, organizing it in a manner that is uh, readable and understandable and then doing an analysis of it so as to ensure that we are able to prioritize correctly in terms of which um, policies we need, to, policy statements we need to be foregrounding um, for this particular period because a policy also has a lifespan and we want to make sure that within this, the lifespan of this particular policy we address those issues that are really critical 
um, but also the issues that are what I call win-wins, you know, where one can achieve certain things quite easily, looking at institutional frameworks, looking at institutional mandates. In probably about October, we'll go back out to the public with a draft of the initial policy. Then we're going to develop a strategic plan which will implement the policy so that it's important that we don't just have a piece of paper that collects dust, that we actually have a dated timeline as to who's going to do what over which period. And last but not least, the cost and operational plan is critical to this because it means this is how we're going to um, afford each of these action plans the funding to get going. For instance, there are many things that we need in terms of national level um, arts organizations that we have not developed yet because of the lack of funding. We welcome the public to use our social media. We have the Ministry of Health and Culture has a fabulous Facebook page which is updated a few times a week as well as the Ministry of Health and Culture website. And most other ministries are aware of this because we work with other ministries and make sure that we're interministerial approach to this and also public and private sectors are very, very involved in this process as well. We just ask that people stay in tune if they have anything that they would like to um, contribute to the process, it's important. A long time coming and I'm really anxious to see that it gets done and that we, we get it implemented very quickly. So. I know that the, uh, the committee is working quite diligently, putting a lot of time and energy into it. Um, I want to just urge them to continue, keep their focus and, and, uh, and get the, the policy completed, get it approved by that committee so they can come to cabinet ultimately for approval. Uh, for me, it couldn't come quick enough.